All right, uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, and happy birthday to Dirk. So as I wrote celebrating 60 years of achievement, I'm pretty sure your parents thought you were achieving things at a uh, very early age, but uh, I got to uh, meet Dirk around uh, 1998. His reputation had actually preceded him. A friend of mine was his PhD student. Um, and uh, we um, started talking at the IGS and talked through the years and these uh, interactions have been uh, very important for me in my work. And some of the things I'm about to say wouldn't exist if uh, uh, I hadn't talked to Dirk or would exist in some other form. All right, and um, so since this is going to be a little bit technical, I, I switch it up. I'll have pictures first and explain what I'm trying to make uh, technical sense out of. And what usually happens is that after I made technical sense out of it, it's uh, pretty long and very correct and very mathematical, but maybe the pictures and examples will uh, provide a guiding way through this uh, categorical uh, structure that I'm going to introduce. So uh, the main character will be Feynman categories. I'll, I'll see what happens. Uh, sorry, I'll define what that is. But uh, what I want to stress is that, uh, so actually, can you see my cursor? That, I never know if that's true or not. I can see it, can I think it's good. It? Yes. Yes, okay, so, uh, so then I can do this. So the point is that these things are morphisms. And if you know something about categories, morphisms start out to be sets, but then like in vector spaces, I can add morphisms. So the morphisms of between vector spaces are vector spaces. So having more structure on the morphisms is actually very natural. And this is uh, important, even if you're starting to sum morphisms, as you do in these Hopf algebra things. So and then the main objective is a deep understanding of the theoretical underpinnings. There is something which I've been starting to do recently is actually once you have that, you can actually do calculations. And I'll have some examples of that. And it gives you unexpected links between algebra, geometry, and physics. So uh, one uh, large thing that if you want to go towards algebraic geometry, like uh, in the last talk, uh, you see that you'll have functors and a six functor formalism. So it looks a little bit, if you, if you want to go that way, like sheaves. All right, so uh, there, there, how do I get from one thing to the other? So very much what we hear in this conference is you want to go from combinatorics to algebra. And the point is that either you can look at the morphisms and they will give you a colored or partial algebras and then you get half algebras and bi algebras as we've been discussing. The other thing you can do is you can look at representations and I'll, be, I'll give a very basic example of this a little bit later on. And so in general, they will be functors into a target category and that immediately switches uh, your possibilities to have a target category that's combinatorial again, or algebraic, so linear, you can have sums, or geometric, so uh, you know spaces, uh, topological spaces, moduli spaces, and things like that. And then there is a thing, there is an interaction between these levels where you can take these representations and put them back onto the category. Let me put it this way, and that is called enriching. And then just like I said before, for vector spaces, now you can have spaces of morphisms, DG morphisms, and so on and so on. And if you stay in this framework, all the universal things will remain true. All right, so uh, then uh, what else can you do? So there is a, there is, uh, you can get uh, um, something I call the Groten deconstruction, which tells you that you can uh, decorate things and make more examples out of examples. Uh, what I will talk about is one way to get topological spaces is you do a W construction. That's a name that's well known in topology. Uh, and you will get cubical complexes. And if you apply this to the combinatorial structure of graphs, you end up with moduli space. And I found that one of the most amazing things in this whole story. I will talk about this uh, later. This is also joint work with uh, Clemens Berger. Then, uh, there, uh, another thing which is nice, there's sort of, and I'll talk a little bit about, about, about this, there's a plus construction, there's certain hierarchies, where you start out with something simple, just an object. Then you apply this and you get something that is simplicial. And we've seen that uh, here a little bit. Uh, it's all, it will reappear. And then you get to the planar rooted trees, uh, which are basic to one of the Hopf algebras of Kahn and Kleiman. 
You could also do something a little bit more difficult and then you would end up in cross simplicial sets and sometimes they're known, uh, so one flavor are non-commutative sets, uh, which you can get and then you get into rooted trees, so the symmetric guys. Uh, you could stay in the planar setting and we've discussed that or you could just start at graphs and get structures for those. All right, so here are the promised pictures. So what is the basic idea that you know, a physicist can maybe relate to? Uh, so uh, we, are, we have a Feynman diagram. Uh, this is in phi to the three theory. Uh, the idea is I wanna use this as a morphism. So what should be the morphism? It should go from a source and a target. So what is the target? The target is basically you contract all the inner edges and you end up with a vertex, which just says the three external legs. And what should be the source? The source should be uh, all the vertices, all the local structures. So I just break all the edges, that's my source. And then if this is a morphism and I have a category and that's the important thing, in categories, I can compose morphisms. And here's a decomposition of the morphism and already you see the story, if you're familiar with it, appearing because you see that this piece of information here is a subgraph, it's this subgraph. And when I, if I contract that, then uh, three of these vertices, maybe U, V, and W, just merge into one vertex, which I give a new name R. And then I can put these vertices onto a new graph and contract that. And the theorem, which is later, is that uh, this is a natural structure. This just appears without me doing very much. And then this factorization actually inserts this graph into this graph. There's a little bit more uh, that I wrote this as a note. You have to be careful if you want this to be an actual category. I was a little bit about glib about sort of just marking the vertices. I'll have an example later on. You have to mark all the flags. You have to instance say that U, V, and W actually are mapped to this vertex R. So if you look at this example long enough, it actually reveals all the features that you need for a strict definition. And this is what I already said, the composition of morphisms, which is, goes like this, this will be insertion of graphs into graphs. So I'm inserting this graph into the vertex R and I obtain this graph. And if I contract a subgraph, I get a factorization because I can read off the subgraph. This will give me this morphism. And if I contract the subgraph, I get this one. So this is also very much like in the last talk, looking at subobjects and quotient objects. All right, so uh, there is uh, the subtleties that uh, come with the marking is that you have to get the isomorphisms and automorphisms right. And uh, you all know that there are all these factors with automorphisms that you have to take into account. So what you actually have is these stars aren't, these vertices aren't vertices, but they actually are vertices with automorphism groups. So we're looking at a groupoid. And uh, that gives us, if we, uh, someone, one of the subtleties is that we actually get multiplicities coming out in these half algebra structures that I'm talking about. The second part of the title are cubical complexes. And again, I'll start with a picture. So here's a picture of uh, uh, what may it be. So let's say uh, this is a rooted tree, but it actually doesn't even have to be rooted. Uh, I have edges. I put labels on the edges, which are parameters from zero to one. So S and T are that live in an interval. So this is an actual square. And then I can send S and T uh, separately to one or zero. And what do I do? There are actually two things I can do. So uh, if I send something to zero, I just contract the edge and I multiply the labels. So if I uh, send T to zero, I go over here and I multiply B and C. If I send T to one, there are two things I can do. And this actually comes out uh, of talking to Dirk. Previous, prior to talking to Dirk, I would have just marked that as one and called that a frozen edge. After talking to Dirk and looking at these Kapkowska rules, I could just also forget this edge. Uh, so what's marked blue, I can forget that or cut that edge. So, uh, and then you can go around and see what's going on. So if I would go up here, I either have two frozen edges or two cut edges. And here I just multiply everything together. And if that looks familiar, that's uh, because, uh, it, 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 sorry, I'll, I'll talk about this later. There, there are several other ways to look at this for instance, the bar complex. So now let me just very briefly say what a Feynman category is. So I said you have these basic objects, they will form a groupoid. So think of the local vertices. Uh, the category itself will be a symmetric monoidal category. So it has a tensor product 
for the graphs, this is just disjoint union. I have an inclusion, which gives me uh, the basic objects. And then I need some notation. So if I have a vertex, I can look at the free, at this V, I can look at the free symmetric monoidal category. These are just words and words of isomorphisms, words of automorphisms. So any isomorphism is a word of auto isomorphisms. And then I can include this here, and that's already just the basic structure. So I call such a triple affinement category if this uh, inclusion on the word level is an isomorphism in the equivalents of categories. So that means basically every object is a tensor product of basic objects. So for the graphs, uh, I'm looking at aggregates of stars. And uh, I also have an equivalence of uh, symmetric monoidal categories. I'll explain that uh, in one second. This is the main axiom. This is what will make all the constructions work. So it's not just any monoidal category. There is something special going on here. And this is uh, sometimes called a hereditary condition. And this is the thing that makes things work. And the last one is technical. I just put it on here because it's uh, needed for some computations that they actually work. So what's a, a basic consequence? So let me try this. This is the first time I tried this live. So what this is saying is that if I have any morphism, say uh, y or x mapping to y, then by the first axiom, I can write this as some tensor product of some basic objects. And I'll write star v to remind you of the vertices of the graph. And then what this axiom says is that if this is a phi, then I can complete this by looking at sort of fibers of this morphism. So there's another isomorphism here to this guy. And there is a map here, which is a tensor product of phi v. And each of these phi v's is a morphism from x v to star v. So what this says is uh, that if I go back one slide, so this says that this is exactly what's written here. I can decompose any morphism into these morphisms, which go from a more complex object to a simple object. So this is from many stars to one, one star. So what does this mean? Uh, for physics or for graphs, so first of all, to make this um, stringent, you can work in the so-called borisov mining category of graphs. And then we restrict to those graphs, which are just aggregates of corollas. And then we get graphs back as the underlying graphs. So this, these three lines just explain that there is an actual very strict categorical setup where the pictures I'm drawing make strict sense. And in physics, uh, how, how to think about that, uh, these are the vertices of the theories and the morphisms are the possible Feynman graphs. So that's why I use phi to the three. And of course, in a physical theory, you can embed one graph into another graph and have another graph of the theory, or you can read off, pull out these graphs. And that's all uh, that this, uh, that you can do this is clear from, from uh, sort of expansion of Feynman diagrams. And this is of course the main thing that underlies the Hopf algebra. And uh, what you can think about, so the interesting thing, one, one interesting thing might be that, you know, what, what is this, what are these categories if I map to a single vertex? Well, what is that? So that just means I have any graph looking over this, and these are usually the terms in the S matrix, terms in the S matrix. And now you know why I don't have handwritten notes. All right, so let me kill those. And, uh, Here's again the same diagram of composing two things. So, and basically, I will compose two morphisms in this category of graphs. They will have underlying graphs. I have this double bar to denote that they're the ghost graphs. They're not actual graphs uh, because there's some information. So, they are actual graphs, but they do not characterize the morphism completely. But what they do characterize, and this is important, they characterize the isomorphism class. So looking just at isomorphism classes, this diagram turns into this diagram. And so what I see is the factorization of one graph uh, into uh, subgraphs and the quotient graph. So what are sort of in this category of graphs, uh, basic morphisms, so okay, so these are the, the basic morphisms in one sense. Uh, and uh, these basic morphisms are basically connected graphs, if you wish. For a, a large class of example, it's just connected graphs, and then these will be disconnected graphs. 
But then these graph morphisms, uh, see if I contract a subgraph, I can do this one edge at a time or one loop at a time. And so even these <clears throat> morphisms decompose into elementary morphisms, I shouldn't have called them basic. Um, and the elementary ones are, you have two vertices, you join them by an edge and contract the edge. The other one, you have two flags of a, or legs of a vertex, you connect them by a loop and then contract it. And the last one, <clears throat> this is important for non-connected things to make them connected. Uh, you can just merge them together. So uh, this has at least three applications. Um, uh, one is something we saw in Martin Heider's talk. This is uh, getting props to work. So taking two things and putting them together. The other one is geometric. This is actually an incarnation of the connected sum of two things. So I have two disconnected, two things which are not connected and I put them together to get the connected sum. And the third thing, these are important to write down uh, BV equations as master equations. But uh, let's just include them. So after saying that they're good, but let's uh, forget them for a while. All right, so we move on to the next thing. What are representations? And representations are functors. And I can take the functors on the Feynman category itself. And don't worry, I'll have a concrete example in a sec. And uh, look at just the restriction to the elementary objects. And those things I will call ops and modules. And there's a reason for that. There is a trivial functor, so this is just uh, very, uh, you know, mathematically it's saying almost nothing. It's like I always have a monoidal functor where I just send everything to the monoidal unit. So if it's categorical, uh, so if, if, you, if it's set theoretical, just think of mapping everything to a point. If you're looking at k vector spaces, just map everything to k. All right, and then uh, how can I think about this? So if I have a graphical category, I, I can think as a physicist of graphs as Feynman rules, uh, sorry, as these uh, f uh, representations of a graph category as giving me Feynman rules. So first I have to fix the target category. So fixing the target category, I'll be, uh, I'll be in a simple setting here, in which uh, sort of I just have a vector space, a vector space of fields, and I give a quadratic form, which gives me propagators, which is the inverse of the quadratic form I have here. So, and then um, what does the function do? So for each basic object, which was, uh, remember just a one vertex graph, I'll call that star S, S are the, legs of the graph. Uh, this should give me uh, a morphism from some, uh, my vector space W. So you know, I'm associating the following thing to it. So I pick a vector space and I associate to each of these guys. So I'm defining this functor O to each of these guys, the vector space tensor S. And then uh, from the graph morphisms, they are given, sorry, the morphisms of the category are given by graphs. And if I want to know what uh, to do with a graph that should give me a morphism of these vector spaces. And what I do is I just contract the tensors with the Casimir. So let me write just a very quick example. So if I start out uh, with uh, just two vertices like this, one, two, three, four, then I can map that over to one, two, three, four. And what I did is, let's call this five and six. Uh, then what I did is I put together five and six and contract it. And uh, what, what is the uh, operation I get? I have to be able to dualize. So what I want is I want to get an operation from W tensor four to K. And I just take Y of phi one, uh, phi two, phi I, G I J, uh, Y, this is Y one, Y two, phi uh, J, phi three, Phi four, so I'm just contracting uh, in this place and this place. So these are the places that are indicated exactly, exactly by these edges. So it's a straightforward thing. Uh, and then actually, you can check that this gives you a nice functor. So this is functorial, and in this way, you can think about Feynman rules. Uh, what I'm not, what I'm doing here is I'm always mapping to K. And uh, if I'm an algebraic situation, this is a non-degenerate form, that's good enough, I can dualize. Otherwise you have to be a little bit smarter. And that's of course what many of these things are about to be a little bit smarter. This is just a slide saying, okay, if I have these graphs, as I said, you can decorate these graphs and 
operatic people will know this, uh, but non-operatic not so much. I just want to highlight that I did talk about props uh, and uh, Martin Heira's talk uh, was actually something about wheeled props. So even if you don't know this whole zoo, they do appear naturally as something important. And for me, these modular uh, operas and uh, cyclic operas will play a large role because the modular operas are related to modular spaces of curves. All right, so uh, then how do I get my general relations going? So uh, categorically, if I have um, functors, what I can look at is uh, adjoint pairs. And what actually happens if I have a functor uh, between two uh, Feynman categories, so maybe I should write this here. So if I have an F going between one Feynman category F and another Feynman category F prime, what I can do I, is I can push forward and pull back modules from F prime to F or from F to F prime. And uh, so this goes into the computational thing. So uh, uh, category theory actually tells me how to compute these things, namely the push forward and the pullback. And if you care about the six functor formalism, then uh, you can do uh, other things where you have to take a, a right con extension as well. But let me make this a little bit more concrete. Uh, so let's see what happens uh, in the most trivial case possible where I just have one object in V and its identity, then if I look at the symmetric monoidal category or the monoidal category, so let me start with the monoidal category, the three monoidal category are just words. The letter is one. If I repeat one n times, all I'm getting is the number n. So I'm getting the objects as the natural numbers. If I do the free symmetric monoidal category, then if I have the object uh, one tensor n, this has, I can act by just permuting. This is one, 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 one. And I can, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I can permute the ones back and forth. So this will have an action of SN. And this is a typical example of a groupoid. So another way to imagine this is to make contact with what we had before is you think about the star, which is numbered from one to N. All right, and then the V modules are simply objects of C because I just get to map one object, uh, one thing here to there. And then since this is free symmetric, nothing happens to the, uh, to the, um, to F as, as well. Oh, sorry, there's the V modules. All right, sorry. Now uh, to uh, look at what happens uh, if I want to extend that, then I can just take the free extension and say this V tensor is F. And that's what I was just saying. And uh, what I get is just the representations of V, namely uh, the groupoid representations of my objects with morphisms in V. Special case is if I look at this special category where I have one object and the morphisms here are just elements of the group. And now the representations are really group representations. And uh, if you go through the calculations, what you see is uh, if you have two groups, you have a functor for the categories, it's just saying that you send the morphisms by this thing and the object, the only object to it, the only object. And then pullback is restriction and push, push forward. Now you can compute that is induction. And the adjointness is known in representation theory as Frobenius reciprocity. So what uh, this general theorem says is this is true for all Feynman categories. So if you find some functor between Feynman categories, you have restriction and you have induction. This is going to be important later on. Maybe I'll skip this uh, if I'm looking at the clock. I'll skip this and directly um, make these uh, comments uh, that uh, there is this layer where you can look at very combinatorial things. And this is what the slide would be about. Uh, that if you just look at uh, just subjections, what you get out uh, is you can compute. This is again a computation you get commutative algebras as uh, representations. If you do the non-symmetric analog, uh, you get associative algebras. If you actually look at all finite sets, uh, you get unital commutative algebras. You can just look at the other part instead of surjections. You can look at injections. Then you're in the realm of FI algebras, uh, which are popular now in representation stability. And uh, they were introduced by George Farb and Ellenberg. 
If you uh, add symmetries to the non-symmetric part, that's where the cross simplicial groups come in. And this is also where some uh, the non-commutative sets come in. And I have a distinct feeling that this is uh, very much related to a chorus talk uh, that, uh, so non-commutative sets are maps uh, where you have orders on the fibers. All right, so getting to one of the main actors, uh, namely the Hopf algebras of Kahn and Kramer or the, uh, the generalization of that. And this is work that's just been published this year. Uh, unfortunately, very many pages, or fortunately and unfortunately, but to make these things strict uh, is a little bit difficult, but uh, the general idea is easy to state. So what was the main point? The main point was in a category I can compose, so I can also decompose. So naturally I can write out a coproduct. Uh, if I, now you see I have to take some, so I have to enrich or take the free abelian group. Uh, the co-product over all decompositions of a morphism. And so you already saw in the basic example I gave, the decomposition is exactly this subgraph co-graph. So if you want to think about it that way, that's perfectly fine. And this says that this generalizes to any category which is uh, actually finite where this thing is finite. Now you can ask yourself the following question, namely if it's a monoidal category, I also have a, a multiplication. So I get an algebra and a co-algebra structure. And the question, is this a bi-algebra structure? And that turns out to be a little bit subtle. And the answer is basically yes. But you first have to go to isomorphism classes. So you call two morphisms isomorphic if they're related by uh, an isomorphism. And you saw that implicitly in the last talk because they're the um, uh, functions were defined on isomorphism classes. So that actually factors exactly through this, uh, through this uh, quotient. Then the main theorem is that if you started with the Feynman category, indeed, the bi-algebra equation holds and you have a bi-algebra. And this bi-algebra is usually not connected. And if you want to get the usual things that you're used to, which are connected, you have to take a quotient. And then this, uh, that under explicit checkable assumptions, there is a con canonical quotient, which is indeed a Hopf algebra. And so, in the non-sigma case, uh, this is easier if you don't have uh, automorphisms of your object. So say you're looking at planar stuff, then uh, already B before going to isomorphism classes is a bi-algebra. And then the quotient is also very easy. You just take uh, the identity morphisms minus one, where one is the identity of uh, the, your monoidal category. So it's the identity of the identity. And the reason is that if you decompose a morphism, uh, you see ex exactly that uh, that you'll get this decomposition for any morphism phi. You might have uh, the identity. So if I'm going from x to y, I can always split by going through x, or I can split by just going through y, the same morphism. And so I'll get these two things. So in half algebraic terms, you see that th this thing won't be primitive. It will be it x, it y primitive at the most. And that's actually an interesting structure that my, my student is actually working on uh, currently. And now, I can't click it that way. Uh, the, the, the incredible thing to us when we, when we computed these things is I did something quite general. So now I can feed in my surjections and look at what I get. And I actually get out Goncharov's Hoff algebra for um, multi zeta values. I can uh, put in uh, a certain uh, enrichment of surjections and I get, uh, namely leaf label trees, I get con crimes half algebra of trees. I can do this for this category of graphs, which I had before. So I get con crimes graph algebra. And this was maybe the most surprising. So if I look at this example here um, and take care of signs, I get actually a half algebra that Bao was invented in a completely different setting to look at, look at double loop spaces. So this is some simplicial structure that is hidden in con mass algebra. And here are the associated pictures. Uh, I hope your resolution of the monitor is good. Yeah, you know, usually I project this into a larger thing. So uh, this is the half algebra structure you're used to. This is a rooted tree. This dotted line is a admissible cut. Uh, whatever is on top falls off. And uh, so, you see, if I label everything, then I have to label all these cuts 
And so I did this here. So this is the planar version of doing this. And you see now I can't just stick with labels from one to n. I have to label in arbitrary sets, but this will work out nicely. Uh, another thing which I can do is I can forget the labels and then cut and you see I have no labels anywhere. And this could mean two things. Either I'm in the planar case where I can just label one, two, three, four, five. Oh, this time I may label it this way around. But this has in the planar structure, this has an automatic labeling. So I can look at this picture in planar case. Or I can say, well, I forgot about this. So mathematically, that just means I took the covariance, And then I look at the covariance of this thing. And uh, then I'm in the non-planar case. That's so fully labeled planar or non-planar. And I learned this from a talk of course. Another thing what you could do is, well, I mean, I could say, this is important. This I is the same as that I. So if I want to keep track of the labels this way, I have the automorphism group uh, permuting these labels and that will permute these factors so I can look at the equivariant setting. And now comes the all important quotient. Uh, so what happens here, I have these labels and we've seen uh, in, uh, in, in, in talks before, we've seen the actual Konkaima algebra without leaves, without legs. And so what I have to do is I just have to pull in all these legs. When I do that, uh, everything is fine, except if I only have a leaf here, which I'm allowed to do here. See, I cut just some, through some leaves. And what happens there is this get, goes into one. And that is exactly taking this quotient that I had before making these into the unit. So that's exactly what happens there. All right, so that explains this thing. And just summing up the upshot, uh, we can produce this Konkrimas half algebra, we get Goncharov's half algebra, balances for double loop spaces, there's a non commutative graded version, and we have this threefold hierarchy non commutative, planar, commutative, and then there's an amputated version. All right, and uh, then the decorations, which I will discuss. Uh, I think I'll have some time for that, maybe not that much, but uh, if you now put some, so what do you do to make this structure more elaborate? You want to put in some uh, labels on the vertices and on the edges of the graph, and there are two general constructions for Feynman categories which allow you to do that. Then uh, some more remarks is the why Bowles and Goncharov work is because simplices form an operad. So this is just a simplicial structure that you have. Uh, you can uh, go from this to looking at co-operads with multiplication. And from this, you can deform. And when you look at these deformations, so this might be of independent interest, you can actually get in this thing, you directly see developments and deformations, sort of developments in the notion of Gerstenhaber. And these deformations are Q deformations. So instead of taking this quotient directly that I had, there is an intermediate quotient where you have a Q deformation, which basically sends each of these leaf labels just to, to Q. So this would give me a Q squared. So that's still graded and that is interesting in its own right. And the last remark I'll make, uh, which also relates to many things we've seen here before and uh, things that are gonna come afterwards. So now remember the co-product just said, I do a factorization. So if I do multiple factorizations, what I get is I get composable maps, which are exactly what is sitting in the nerve. And that's actually also where these simplices come from. So an iterated coproduct gives me exactly this element in the nerve. OK, so uh, here is the slide that tells you that uh, what you expect is true. Once you get up to isomorphism classes, then the morphisms are not uh, are actually given by their ghost graphs. So then uh, this uh, factorization uh, of the morphism is exactly looking at the, uh, the, the co-graph and the, uh, so the subgraph and the co-graph. And then at this point, let me mention one other quick thing that uh, at this point is, and this is something that is for the future, you start seeing so the co-module structure appearing because I had these special elements. So if I start factoring a morphism that goes to a special element, I get something that's just a general morphism and again, a morphism that goes to the special element. So you see that this thing here, these form a co-module over the Hopf algebra. And this is sort of, if you want the core Hopf algebra. So that's the beginning of decorating and looking at core Hopf algebras. 
And the other thing I can do is now I can invert this. So if I have an element like this and I have a general morphism here going to Y, I can just combine these and these will be exactly the B plus operators, uh, which take an element here of this special form and I can apply it uh, if the colors are correct. So if this actually has a target of Y and just make that into the uh, product. And then uh, last thing, so how is this really? That is really the B plus operator, because if you think about it, this gamma of phi one, this was uh, a disconnected thing. So if in the conchrima tree version, this actually takes a forest and makes it into a tree. And in the more general thing, you can plug in your primitive elements up here. All right, this is just a, a computation that you do get these multiplicities if you start, um, start uh, labeling everything. So if you start with this graph, uh, I'm certainly not the first one to tell you what the co-product of this is and other people know this much better than I do. And the only thing that I'm trying point I'm trying to make here is this now appears naturally in a very, in the same formalism. I do not have to introduce another ad hoc formalism or anything, just in my Feynman category of graphs, which I had before. If I look at the factorizations, I will get two such factorizations. And that is because I can tell the difference between uh, this edge three, three prime and the edge two, two prime. This will give me two different factorizations. And you see now it's important that I labeled everything because this graph, of course, as an abstract graph, uh, just looks like any other abstract graph, uh, sort of regardless if it's two or three. All right. Now, uh, this one is an explanation of a relation which is also nice. So again, I'm just giving details and pictures of the general story, how they apply to things you may know and love. So if you like the half algebra of Goncharov, you know that uh, the way to write this down is with half circles and segmentations. And I said this has some simplicial feature and is actually related to uh, Conkrimer's trees. And now we actually know exactly why and why not this and how it's related to to, uh, so Gontrop had some guesses, but how these two things are related. And the idea is you take this half circle and you put this uh, tree in here. So this I learned a long time ago from uh, uh, people working in the field. And now what the Hopf algebra does is it would uh, decompose these trees and cut these trees. And the dual picture is uh, sort of taking these half circles and taking the, um, so uh, taking the, uh, so Habat Gango, I was looking for the name. Habat Gango taught me this, and this I learned from Francis Brown in his lectures in Cambridge. So you see the interaction working. So I'm really happy about these things. So you see the segments here, which cut this tree, and this is a duality. But this is actually something very deep, uh, which goes back to Royale, and there is a duality between double pointed. Uh, uh, so intervals, uh, double days pointed maps and uh, maps in here. And you can find a nice uh, version of explanation in this in the papers of uh, uh, Batanin and Daga. And that's uh, where I learned this from. All right, so uh, as I said, then there are several things you can do with this stuff. And you can decorate, you can enrich, and uh, uh, you can do this W construction. So maybe, uh, let me just say something about the decoration. So the decoration, because I need that, the decoration uh, says I can actually decorate vertices. So for the graphs, uh, what's the decoration that uh, one would care about is a cyclic order. Why? Because this makes the graph into a ribbon graph. So if I look at this graph, it has one, two, three, four. It just has a star with four edges. And I can give this this cyclic order or that cyclic order. So either uh, one, two, three, four, or one, four, two, three. And depending on this, I get different, um, different rib graphs, different uh, graphs. And uh, now if I do these decorations just through general, so this again is just a general categorical slide, which says I can mix this with my push forwards and pullbacks and, and decorations. And now, um, let me skip that. Let's apply that to a very nice situation. So I can look at the following subcategory where I just look at graphs which are planar trees, not rooted, just planar trees, inside all of the graphs. Let's say uh, where the morphisms, the basic morphisms are connected. And then I can decorate this in, in two ways, either not at all, and that's a trivial decoration. I can push forward this decoration 
that uh, by general theory gives me a way to look at this category with the decorations and I can, this has then a cover where I resolve these decorations and what I get out is actually something that's known. This is the category for modular operats. So this is graphs with genus markings. And now this is a computation that's important. This is a computation. This is, I'm not defining something, I'm computing something. Same thing if I take the cyclic, uh, what I just told you that I look at sort of uh, these ribbon graphs, but that's not right. So what happens then I take trees with cyclic orders and then I can unfold the tree in the, to the plane. So I get planar trees. So this is what is called uh, the non-sigma cyclic uh, category. And then uh, this uh, general diagram says I can also look at the, so they have a relationship up here and down here I can push forward this decoration and go up here and I get something new, which are, uh, which is a nice category, which is called the category for non-sigma modular operands, but this has meaning for many things. So, and actually maybe I'll say this, this also says that uh, actually this is something about um, fibers of morphism so that I don't have infinite chains if I control this G. So what are the nice things? So we get back these modular spaces. If you push this forward, which is now a calculation, you get types of open surfaces. And then this has an, uh, so this, uh, I, this thanks goes out to Karen Yates on this one. So now you can compute this. The very succinct way of computing this is to use combinatorial knowledge, which means that the spanning tree graph is connected. Doing this actually allows you to uh, calculate the push forward, which in categorical terms is a cold limit. But this now is just something you can sit down and calculate. And uh, actually it's a calculation, which is nice with, uh, with court diagrams, if you wish or some other, some other format of this type and you get out that exactly, the, this is true, this is what you, what you get out is what you expected. And then this immediately applies to something also somewhat combinatorial. So this is this relation between combinatorics and algebra. If I just do the little game that I did before with my correlation functions, you can figure out that if I just look at, uh, just look at trees or cyclic trees, I'm just looking at surfaces and what I get is I get uh, one plus one dimensional TFTs. And then there's a nice theorem saying if I algebraize this, this is the same thing as looking at a Frobenius algebra. And then going up here, I get an open TFT and this uh, is uh, known that this is just the uh, open closed uh, for me as uh, open closed one plus one dimensional TFT. So something happened here. I can compute it. I can compute this stuff combinatorially and I can uh, then uh, do the algebra and I get a nice theorem about these spaces of fields. All right, and now I wanna do this in a higher, higher version where I, the spaces of fields were just algebras, but now I wanna get actual spaces. And what lets me do that is the so-called W construction. And these are technical details. I need something which is true for graphs because if I, uh, there is a commutation relation, if I contract to edges, I can do it in any order. There's a slight subtlety because I cut two different intermediate graphs. And then I can throw on the uh, categorical machine again and compute a cold limit. But what this does in a non-technical version is for each graph um, with n edges, I glue on one cube. And just like I had in the beginning, I have two boundary maps, namely uh, one where the parameter goes to zero, which means I contract, so that's going to zero, or I mark. And as I said before, either marking means freezing or deleting. And then I get a complex by gluing on these along these edges. And again, this is interaction with Dirk. Uh, and again, thanks, for, thanks to you, Dirk. So I know that this has something to do with Kutkowski rules where uh, I do this and there's research ongoing, thinking about what else one can get for these Kutkowski rules. So here's the picture again that I had in the beginning and I already discussed. So now we know exactly what this means. This has two edges, so I get a two cube. This has one edge, so I get a one cube and the boundaries are as explained. Now, um, what is the cubicle structure? I think I started five minutes late. So if I'm, if I'm not cut off directly, I'll spend the five minutes. So here's the other thing to th see that this is actually a simplicial structure and uh, you can write down sort of, uh, so you see now these sequences of morphisms and you see I'm contracting and splitting sequences of morphisms. So this relates to the simplicial structure of the nerve. 
And this is, if you know what the bar complex is, you see that something is happening in the bar complex as well, because, because I'm just removing bars, which, come on, uh, which multiplies the, these A's and B's as markings. Here's another picture where I apply this thing to uh, something more interesting. And this is now I'm blowing up uh, just, uh, so I'm looking at trees and associating cubes to trees. And it's well known if I do this for rooted trees, uh, then it probably goes back to Bergman, uh, uh, Bergman and Folk that I get uh, Associa Hydra. And this plays a role for the cyclic linear conjecture, which was in my abstract. So this is a picture for the cyclic linear conjecture. And there we were marking with one as a frozen variable. And in general, as I said, what you do is you just take a sequence and you associate times T1 up to Tn to these arrows. And if they're zero, you contract them. If they're one, you freeze them. That's too technical. And now I can apply that to this diagram I had before. So remember here, I'm just including a planar, uh, sorry, here I'm just including trees into all graphs. Up here, I make them planar then this is already interesting that it's up here, it's not planar graph, that's wrong. Uh, sorry, it's, it's not a planar graph, that's wrong. It's not ribbon graphs, that's wrong. What it is is uh, what are almost ribbon graphs and their vertex types are exactly given by these surface types, which is interesting of its own thing. And so in work uh, with Clemens Berger, we computed these, uh, these things. So what can you do? You can make this topological and push it over or you can go over and make it topological. So if you push it forward and make it topological, you'll get metric almost ribbon graphs and you'll back, get back the penner uh multiplication. If actually what you get is something contractible and this is where these cones come in that we've seen in several talks and also last time uh, uh, just in the, in the comment section. But when you have this cone with the full mass, what you're doing is exactly this type of thing. So you have a cell and you're coning it off with one point and there is a maximal cone point for everything which would make this contractible. But if you throw out the cone point, you actually get the simplex, the base simplex spec, and this is compact. If you do this upstairs, you make it topological and then push it over, then something magical happens. You immediately get the moduli spaces of curves. And that was a slight lie. You don't immediately get them, but you get something that's, uh, um, that's um, that uh, you can contract these moduli spaces onto. So it's a strong deformation retract. And uh, uh, you can do this even on the cellular level. So there is a there is an algebraic version of this. Won't have time. And now I'll close with a few nice pictures. So here is the picture of sort of getting the moduli space, the combinatorial moduli space. You just take uh, these nice graphs. So the theta graph and, and these graphs. So these loops are uh, cycles. And uh, you get the usual picture of your triangle. And now you see I uh, contract one thing and that has a boundary and that will then con continue on this way. So this is, if I do the uh, construction downstairs, if I do it upstairs and push forward, I only get this. And this is a cubical complex. Notice this is not cubical. This is cubical. It just has one cubes. In higher uh, ends, it would be more cubes. And how do these fit together? They fit together nicely. So there's a contraction which we can give uh, again uh, with uh, Clemens Berger that we uh, that you can uh, put this into the spine here and contract it. And such constructions are known by uh, by Carla Fortman and uh, Igusa and so on and so on. But we have a very nice new combinatorial way of just writing it down, very simplistic, uh, very straightforward. You can you can exactly see what's going on. It's a it's a linear thing. And we can describe that. So now, um, again, these are not defined by hand. So last slide here. Uh, what you can do then is, and this is work with Javier Zuniga. So I want to say something new that maybe I haven't said. So I forgot about this. So then you can start truncating these things. And that's actually also what we did in the, the, the linear conjecture version. And once you truncate these things, you start blowing up these cells. And you can get a full blow up of this. Uh, this complex, and then you can blow this down to this uh, Kamura Stashev Voronov compactification and the Delaney Mumford compactification. So, this guy is the one that appears in string field theory by Zwiebach. This is the one that algebraic geometers care about. And this one is the combinatorial one I actually already discussed. And I'll leave you with a nice picture of a blow up or, or uh, so a relative blow up. So, this is my simplex. 
And then I can do stages of blow ups. You see, this is not a cube, but it has this cubical face. So I, it's a simplex cross of one cube. I glue that onto the faces. And then I glue these uh, cubical things onto the lines. And that was already, so this is actually one simplex and two cubes. And then I'm done. And what I get out is this wonderful picture. And that is uh, one of the known polytopes. It's a cyclohedron. All right, so I'll stop with that. All right, are there questions for Ralph? I have a quick question um, regarding graph complexes. I mean, there's many different graph complexes. You mentioned ribbon graphs. But uh, like in Konsevich's world, like the Konsevich commutative graph complex or so, where do they fit in, in this point of view? Uh, so that's, uh, it's in the paper I can give you in, 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 the, in the, so that has been discussed, but what it is, is this is very similar to the story that you had for, um, for getting the external legs of your graph uh, in the Konkrima tree picture. So there is a general story and there's another code limit you can take. This makes it a universal construction. And then you immediately get out these graph complexes of uh, Konsevich and what Wilbacher is doing with them. So do you have to pick a particular Feynman category and do this construction to get the different graph complexes or? Right, uh, exactly. So you okay. can then, this is this bit with the decoration. So uh, the Feynman category needs to be a little bit special um, that you can, so that allows you to actually contract these legs, but the graphical Feynman categories are nice. And then you can decorate them with all kinds of things you want. For instance, these cyclic orders, or you can make the edges odd to get, you know, fermionic things. And I could have mentioned that I didn't do this. So I just had a cyclic order, but I can also make this sort of anti-cyclic. And then you get these different graph complexes like in Konsevich where you think about interchanging two links and either they're symmetric or they're anti-symmetric to get a sign. Yeah. So yes. Thank you. Right, there's a question in the chat uh, from Jonathan who doesn't have a mic. So he's just written it. Uh, and he, he says, your abstract mentions cones and simplices, what, sorry, cubes and simplices. What about cones? Are they important? Right, the cones, they actually appeared here. So the cones are important. So uh, the thing is that if you do this construction here, then you see here's the cone. And what happens is the W construction is actually something which is co-fibered, which means that if you started out with something that was a point, you get something that's contractible and the cone is contractible. But the, 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 the funny thing though, is that if you remove the cone point, it doesn't need to be contractible anymore because it gets to the base. And this is where the cones appear. So then somehow I had this feeling because just previously somebody was asking, you know, how do you disassemble these things, uh, these simplices? And then in, uh, uh, I'm gonna, so in the, in the talk uh, of, um, I'm gonna butcher his name, so I better look it up. Uh, that we had for these uh, topological, so geometric, um, uh, the geometric decomposition of, um, I can't find it, uh, the geometric decomposition of uh, the uh, of these uh, computations of Feynman integrals, uh, you also had this cone and then you dissect uh, with these regular right angles, you dissect uh, this, uh, the, the, the base of this cone and then you look at that. So I have a feeling that uh, this kind of picture fits in perfectly with that. He follows up by asking if you have an understanding of the product of two cones. The product of two cones. I haven't thought about that, but probably yes, because this is something, uh, because this cone comes in from a push forward here that automatically makes this cone happen. And that uh, is, I can see that. So there must be some interesting truncation going on there because you get the cone here. So let me go to the graphs and say this here. So you have these, uh, in the ribbon graph, you have these parameters that say here A, D, B, and the cone comes about because you can set all these things to zero so you know what the cone point is. So, in, uh, but there's only one cone point because there's only one zero graph, there's only one zero, that's what everything contracts to. So I would have, uh, I could venture, I guess, what happens there. All right, uh, Megan has a question. I think she should be able to unmute herself now. Okay, or not. Uh, how about Alex Takeda? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, yeah. So uh, you mentioned quickly these, uh, uh, you mentioned before these, uh, this push forward and six functor formalism. 
That was very interesting. I uh, just wanted to ask you if uh, th there's any examples that I would I would uh, known of uh, push forwards. Like if I give you an a infinity um, al algebra, do I, can I push you forward to something over like a modular operator or something of the sort? Is uh, yes, you can. And uh, so the point was that I'm I what I just what I computed was sort of the modular envelope. I guess you know what I mean uh, of, of an actual algebra. That's uh, what was this. That's exactly, uh, I'm, I'm looking for something in particular. Hold on. Right, so I was looking at this. So uh, the point, what I was looking at is sort of just, uh, so I was just looking at algebras that's related to this TFT business, uh, but I could have started instead of just looking at cyclic associative, what I can look at is I can take an infinity version of that and then push out forward the infinity version so I can resolve here. And then I would get A infinity algebras and then you can play the same game with A infinity algebras. And do the push forward, and uh, yeah, I can. That that's can, that can be done. Yes, I see. So uh, because I would imagine that if you, for instance, the infinity case, for example, to push it forward, you would need a uh, an infinite algebra, infinite algebra, and something like a pairing. So does this give right? Me uh, sorry, yeah, I should have said cyclic, cyclic A infinity. Yeah, the, I, I see. So it gives me uh, uh, okay. So I already have an information of the pairing. Right. Okay. Uh, there is a diagram which I don't have. I mean, I could add here just the, the one that comes for, for sort of just for trees. Yeah. And that has a relation. So you can take the free thing with that too. Or you can, uh, if you're happy, I mean, part of the problem uh, is uh, something that I said before. So the question is if your infinity thing has a non degenerate form or not a non degenerate form without any kind of integral, I don't think you can do something, right? I mean, you can't put it onto graphs. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to be able to contract indices, right? I see. So you, you might get something like sum over all possible. Um, right. And then it's either going to be trivial or free or however you want to say it. So if you don't put that information in. I see. OK, thank you. But, but maybe that last thing with that, but if you do trivial or free, the only the one thing you can always do, and we've seen that here, if you don't want it to be trivial or free, you just put a Q there and sort of just count the number of vertices, uh, number of edges. I see. So you can you can do some genus or maybe number. Right. Value. Exactly. Something something like that. It's right. Okay. All right. Time is getting on. I imagine people uh, have to get on to the next thing in their lives. So let's have one final question from David. So so wonderful mixture of the very concrete and specific as well as the categorically abstract. Can you just remind me what your ghost graphs have lost? When you start with the very concrete things, what have you thrown away and what do they still know? Right, so uh, that I can tell you. Let me just try, I actually prepared a slide with nothing on it <laughs> so I can write on it. And if I would be smarter, I could just click there. So uh, what happens there? So uh, let me exactly do the example I had in the, sorry, look at the example, this example. So, where I glue this together, it just drew a two-point thing with this graph, right? So uh, if I just had this ghost graph here, this guy, I I wouldn't have see what what the, so it keeps some information, but it keeps the abstract graph. It doesn't know uh, is this you know what I'm doing drawing now is what the what the morphism knows that the ghost graph doesn't know. So I have two vertices here. The ghost graph will know which one is which. Okay. So the ghost graph will not know which one is which, but the morphism will. So I need to identify this vertex and that vertex. And maybe like, uh, so maybe actually let me make two legs here. So, uh, and then the other thing it forgets is, you know, I have a symmetry on these two guys, which would be the symmetry of these two things. And so the ghost graph uh, so it doesn't remember which one is which, but the actual morphism will remember which one is which of these. Okay. Thank you. All right, let's thank Ralph for his talk. Thank you.